The Lord be with you. you. Good morning and welcome to worship at North Bethesda United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Bonnie and it's a joy to be in worship with you today. I want to say a special welcome to any of you who are guests with us for the first time today. Know that your presence here is a gift from God to us. We're so glad that you're here. I also want to say good morning to those of you who are worshiping with us online today. Uh, We feel your presence in this sanctuary and know that we are with you in spirit as well. I did hear from Reverend Kara this morning because today she is uh, getting on an airplane and beginning her long adventure walking across France and Spain. Uh, So I think she could use an extra bit of our prayers this morning as she embarks on that adventure, which I know will be uh, so nourishing to her body and her soul. In the meantime, we're celebrating a little bit of Christmas in March today because of where we are on our journey through Manna and Mercy. Uh, So I hope that celebrating this um, moment when God becomes incarnate in human flesh Uh, will be respite since it is not accompanied by all the pressures and demands of the Christmas season. We can simply receive the gift today. Uh, So let's stand and join together in our call to worship. Good morning. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. We long to provide to guides. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. We long for God's joy. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. We long to be lead for every carry. For a child has born, been born to us, 
a son given to us. He is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is named God with us. This tiny baby, this vulnerable child, and joy and comfort, joy to the world, and all of this come. Our opening hymn is surely the presence of the Lord in the hymnal 328. I'm going to be reading from chapter 10 of Manna and Mercy. It is a book with pictures in it, so if I have any kids who want to come look at the pictures with me, I'll just sit right here. Chapter 10, God's Surprise. In the land of injustice and division, there lived a group of poor people who trusted God's promises. Do you see those people there? They're saying, come, O oh God, save us, come and deliver us. They were sometimes called the Anawim. Under the heavy weight of their oppression, they cried out to God. They pleaded with God to send a prophet like Elijah and then a king like David, a ruler who would liberate them and establish everlasting justice and mercy, a man of society that would never end. Or in other words, the people really wanted someone. They wanted someone who would come help them. God heard the cry of the people and the cry of all who were oppressed. All creation waited. Should we wait? We wait a long time for the church service to end sometimes, huh? We're very good at waiting. Silence filled the universe. Would God act again as God had acted in Egypt and Babylon? Would God liberate this people again? Would God mold them once again into a man of society, a people who would attract nations to the way of mercy? All creation rejoiced when God announced, I will not give up. I will act again. Who do you see there? Is that a boy or a girl? What do you think? Is that a girl? Do you know what her name is? Her name is Mary. Pay attention to how many times today you hear the name Mary. Mary is a special woman because God moved in a way that surprised every part of creation. Instead of a dramatic Red Sea type of event, God found a young woman among the Anuim. She loved God and learned for the day when God would liberate her people and restore the manna society. Her name was Miriam. Mary in English. She willingly offered herself to be a servant of God, a partner in God's promise to mend the entire universe. The Spirit of God breathed into Mary's womb as the Spirit had breathed into the watery depths to bring forth the first creation. There with Mary, in Mary, God formed a new creation and a new humanity. This human earth creature would be called Emmanuel, God with us. You see in this picture here, there's Mary and there's her partner, Joseph. What's that? Is it an animal? Yes, Mary had a baby surrounded by all these animals. 
Mary gave birth while she and, her jo and Joseph, her fiance, were lodged in a stable. She held her newborn in her arms and repeated the song she had sung when the child was conceived. She sang, my soul proclaims the greatness of God and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. You have routed the arrogant. You have cast down the mighty from their thrones and have lifted up the lowly. Amen. So you want to pay attention to how many times you hear Mary mentioned in the service today, and you can tell me after church how many times, because today is all about her and her son. Thank you. Thank you very much. right we come now to lift our prayers our joys and our concerns to each other as a community and before god in prayer so we will pass microphones if anyone has a joy or a prayer concern to share For a friend of mine who's seeking some medical advice from an ENT this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For, for a friend of mine, uh, George, 
who underwent a heart procedure during the week in ablation. And the procedure went well, but he's hoping it does the trick and uh, you know, heals his heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our neighbor, Ina, who fell this week and broke a hip, she's elderly, but very active, and she'd actually broken her other hip earlier, and that one wasn't 100% healed. So, thank you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Continue prayers for Maddie Gines. Uh, she's feeling a little bit better. Thank you for your prayers. Praise God. For Elvira Williams, who's recovering from knee surgery this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For my aunt, who's been diagnosed with colon cancer, she's elderly, and the decision whether or not to uh, use chemo or not is something weighing on her mind. So prayers for her. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High, Prince of Peace, be born again into our world. Wherever there is war in this world, wherever there is pain, wherever there is loneliness, wherever there is no hope, come, thou long-expected one, with healing in thy wings. Gracious and holy God, we ask you now to help us unclutter our lives. Help me to organize myself in the direction of simplicity. Teach me to listen to my heart. Teach me to welcome change instead of fearing it. Lord, I give you these stirrings inside of me. I give you my discontent. I give you my restlessness. I give you my doubt. I give you my despair. I give you all the longings I hold inside. Help me to listen to these signs of change, of growth. Help me to listen seriously and follow where they lead through the breathtaking empty space of an open door. Into our world you have come, Lord Christ, as a humble child, welcomed into our arms as we welcome you as you welcome us into your arms, skin on skin, flesh on flesh. Today we gather to receive the gift of Christmas, to receive your coming and coming again. We pray that above all, we get to taste your mercy, the gift of your merciful love. And we pray together as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 198, My Soul Gives Glory to God.
Our scripture lesson for today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. Mary visits Elizabeth. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has hap this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, my child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And now Mary's song of praise. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has looked with favour on the lowly state of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth for three months and then returned to her home. Thanks for this message of hope and blessing. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. For you are this community's strength and this community's redeemer. Amen. Have you ever noticed that Mary, upon finding out the news that she is pregnant, seems quite terrified? I'm picking up on her terror by her complete lack of things to say. After the angel's unusual announcement, we get a mere nine words out of Mary, and they are all short words too. Let it be with me according to your word. That's all she says. When we were learning to read scripture out loud in preaching class in seminary, we actually spent an entire 90 minute class period reading and rereading those same nine words out loud. Why? Because the way you read scripture reflects the way you interpret scripture. And there's no way for us to read the Bible without interpreting it. We necessarily interpret even by just reading the words aloud. Let it be with me according to your word is a lot different than let it be with me according to your word is a lot different than let it be with me according to your word. Some student in class would pipe in and say, Professor, shouldn't we just read it the normal way without adding our own interpretation to it? So how do you think you should read it? The professor asked. Let it be with me, according to your word. So you interpret Mary as boring? Bored? The truth is that we don't know how Mary said those nine words or how she felt about them, only that her words were few. And I suspect that her scarcity of words was probably a mixture of fear and confusion and not knowing what to say or whom to say it to. Mary, found to be pregnant 
while unmarried with a child not belonging to her fiance, I don't think I need to belabor the point that it didn't look good. When Mary is sent to stay, hide really, with her cousin Elizabeth, will Elizabeth accept her, believe her, trust her? Will she offer Mary a merciful welcome or a judgmental dismissal? Mary arrives and Elizabeth, also pregnant, feels the baby in her womb leap for joy. She's filled with the Holy Spirit and cries out, blessed are you, Mary, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Elizabeth not only welcomes Mary without judgment, she blesses her. And Elizabeth's blessing does something. Uh, there's a language, I think it's German, that has um, two different words for the word word. There's a word that means, like a word that just communicates. But there's also a word that means a word that does something. Elizabeth's words, same with any blessing, they do something. Just like the words, let there be light, or the words, I love you. These words actually change the reality. And Elizabeth's warm welcome and blessing change the reality for Mary, because suddenly Mary is no longer tongue-tied. Suddenly, Mary has so much to say that it takes 10 whole verses in the Bible. She spills out 10 verses of praise, beginning, my soul magnifies the Lord. Many years ago, when I was happily serving my fourth year at a lovely church as their pastor, I received an unexpected call from my district superintendent. It was November, and November is not appointment season. But he called and asked me to make a mid-year appointment change to a church and a town I had never heard of, and to become a solo pastor for the first time. I was 27, I was single, I had finally just made some friends, and I was scared. When the news was announced to my beloved congregation that I was leaving, I was worried they would be upset with me for leaving. But that day after worship, they all greeted me in the receiving line. And you know what they did? They blessed me. Person after person said, you're going to be great. I'm so sad for us, but I'm so happy for your next church. I believe in you. God will be faithful to you. And blessing after blessing after blessing, by the end of that receiving line, the reality was changed. I wasn't scared anymore. I was excited and ready to heed the call of God. And so is Mary, by the blessing of Elizabeth, now ready to heed the call of God. And so Mary offers the Magnificat, this song that was first penned by her great-great-great-great-grandmother, Hannah. Hannah first sang a version of this song centuries ago when she was found to be with child after a long season of infertility. We just heard those words in the hymn that we sang, and I think it's beautifully rendered in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. Mary sings, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my savior God. God took one look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate one on earth. But Mary talks about more than just herself. She talks about what God will do for the whole society. God's mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before God. God bared his arm showing strength scattering the bluffing braggarts. God knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. God embraced his chosen child Israel, remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. Again and again, we hear Mary and the biblical writers use this word, mercy to describe their interactions with God. In this exuberant song, Mary is as one who has received mercy, who has felt it, tasted it, let it sink into her bones and change her. This mercy changes her demeanor and blesses her. If you pay attention, 
You'll notice that many of the conversations or arguments rather that tend to grace our political stage in this country have to do with mercy. We ask, who deserves to have their loans forgiven? We ask, who was this law designed to unduly impact? We ask what's more important, the right to do what I want or the responsibility to protect others. We ask, should we be giving out these free meals? Should Medicare be for all? We are almost always having a cultural conversation about mercy, even if we have no theological language to name it as such. Who should receive mercy? Mary's Magnificat makes it clear, the lowly, the poor, the forgotten and forsaken. But Jesus's life will show us too the way that tax collectors and the rich and the politically powerful also need a kind of mercy because mercy begets mercy. When the manna people of God, whose story we have been following, receive mercy, when they cry out for deliverance from slavery, when they are fed in the wilderness 40 years, when they begin to take their own land, God is so afraid so afraid that they will forget the mercy they have been shown and begin to oppress others. God even tells them, keep a jar of manna with you always, a reminder to be merciful as I have shown mercy to you. I don't know about you, but I need that reminder sometimes as well, that God has shown me mercy. In fact, uh, just last night, I had to see a friend, a dear friend of mine, who has very much betrayed me in the last two weeks. She's done something that I know, even she knows, was wrong and hurtful, even if she's pretending it wasn't. And I knew that I had to see her in a group setting last night, and I was dreading it. I was replaying her offense against me in my head, laying out my case against her, crafting my pain and dwelling in my anger. I didn't want it to end our friendship, but I wanted to make her feel the pain that she had caused me. Well, I happened to be working on this sermon right before the event, and I had literally just written this line, mercy begets mercy. And then God was like, hey, Bonnie, when you see her tonight, why don't you try to receive your friend the way Elizabeth received Mary? Why don't you go out of her way to make her feel mercy? Darn it, God, but I had such a good case against her in my head. And so I tried. I honestly tried to extend that love. My performance was not as awe-inspiring as Elizabeth's, but the mercy that I could muster was, I hope, enough to put her at ease and to create the conditions loving enough for a future conversation about what went wrong these last two weeks and about how our friendship can heal from it. I've heard it said that there are two types of Christians. There are Christians who go around asking, is this a sin? Is that a sin? Is that a sin? And there are Christians who go around asking, is that a gift? Could that possibly be a gift of the Holy Spirit? And Elizabeth, confronted with an unmarried pregnant lady on her doorsteps, could have asked, is this a sin? But thank God she asked, is this a gift? A gift of the Holy Spirit? Elizabeth offering a merciful welcome to Mary gave Mary the grace and courage to mercifully welcome the Son of God now taking up residence in her womb. Mercy begets mercy. And like his mother and aunt, Jesus' birth, life, and death were all rich in mercy. The Christmas story is one of those marvelous opportunities to lay aside our adult egos and shame and to receive the gift of mercy like little children in a nativity play. And that's why we'll be singing a Christmas carol as our closing hymn. Mercy is hard to define in a scholarly way, 
but it is a marvelous thing to experience. So I want to conclude with a story told by the author Naomi Shai Nahib. She is a Palestinian poet, intimately familiar with the land where Jesus was born. And poets help us to feel things that we might otherwise deny ourselves. She writes, Wandering around the Albuquerque airport terminal after learning my flight has been delayed four hours, I heard an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate A4 was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing. Talk to her, said the flight attendant. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late and she did this. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke haltingly. Shudawa, Shubiruk, Abiti, Stani Shwe. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatments the next day. I said, no, we're fine. You'll get there just later. Who is picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son. I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother until we got on the plane and ride next to her. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons just for the fun of it. Then we called my dad and he spoke to her for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, they had 10 shared friends. Then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took up to two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, patting my knee, telling about her life, answering questions. She pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts from her bag and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lonely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar. And smiling, there is no better cookie. And then the airline broke out free apple juice from huge coolers and two little girls from our flight ran around serving it and they were covered with powdered sugar too. And I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves. Such an old country tradition, always carry a plant, always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones and I thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying and confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. I'm sure you noticed that this is a story of manna, the powdered cookies, and mercy. Christ comes in strange ways, asking to hold your hand, and show you how mercy begets mercy. Merry Christmas in March, my friends. Amen. Because God has given us the greatest gift, through our tithes and our offerings, we return a portion of those gifts back to God through our offering. I invite you to give generously.
Join me in the unison prayer in your bulletin. Gracious God, you have created a world with enough manna and enough mercy for all. Through these gifts, we humbly try to find more balance in our world. We pray for a lesser division between rich and poor, between first and last, between exalted and humbled. We pray that these gifts might humble our own hearts and give us the capacity to see through the eyes of love and grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen.
will join together in singing our closing hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 196. <laughs> you all to stay and join us for a coffee hour in the fellowship hall down the hallway and i know those of you gathered on zoom like to stay and chat with one another this has always been my favorite part of the worship service the benediction um uh, especially because i don't have to write it every week i just use the words that were written hundreds and hundreds of years ago but talk about words that are meant to do something words that change the reality that is what blessings are as Christians, we believe in the power of words to bless or to curse. So may we be people who receive blessings and offer blessings. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up her countenance upon you and give you peace. Go forth trusting in the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. Thank you.